My name is Bill Bialik. I'm one of the directors of the initiative for the theoretical sciences uh, at the Graduate Center. The Graduate Center is home to 32 different uh, doctoral programs ranging from anthropology to urban education, uh, which leaves a little room for more creativity at the end of the alphabet, as you'll notice. Um, it's an institution that, as many of you probably know very well, takes seriously the, the mission of bringing the frontiers of scholarship to the general public. And we've been trying to do that in the sciences now for several years. And this evening is one in um, a series of events. It is uh, a delight to be able to welcome Jenny Safran from the University of Wisconsin, where she is a distinguished professor of psychology. Um, Jenny's gonna be talking to us about um, something that I think resonates uh, uh, very widely. Um, which relates to the large audience, which is how babies learn language. Um, Jenny's really a pioneer of the subject. I, I, have, the, I have this vivid memory of reading her first papers um, where she introduced some of the ideas, which I suspect will, will figure prominently in, in what you hear this evening. Um, her work uh, has not only caught the attention of the scientific community, which has honored her in various ways, including with election to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, um, but also um, it has caught the attention of the general public. She, some of you may know uh, her segment on the Netflix series Babies, um, which, was, which was wonderful um, and, and I thought brought um, really deep ideas uh, to our television set, which isn't, isn't such a common thing. Um, one of the things that we've been trying to do uh, is to couple our public events and our scientific events. So tomorrow, uh, there's going to be a symposium for scientists on the topics of language, learning, and networks. And we will range widely from the kinds of experimental psychology that, uh, uh, that Jenny will talk about to um, very theoretical uh, topics from the physics community, from the artificial intelligence community, and so on. Um, and what we wanted to do, what we were trying to do, is to precede these events, the scientific events, with a public event where we uh, convey to you uh, some of the excitement that we all feel um, about the ideas that we get to spend our time enjoying um, on, the, on the following day. So um, let me not take up any more time except to remind you of Zoom etiquette, keep yourselves muted. Um, uh, your video camera is a matter of your own taste. Um, I think the plan is that there will be uh, pauses to every 15 or 20 minutes or so, um, during which time it'll be possible to, uh, for Jenny to catch up uh, with questions. I encourage you uh, to put questions into the chat. Um, and we will try and I will keep an eye on that. And uh, if something's really urgent, I might interrupt, but if not, um, we'll, we'll come at these, uh, at these assigned breaks. Um, the lecture itself should uh, take about 45 minutes, which will leave 10 to 15 minutes for a real question and answer period afterwards, um, at which point you'll be invited to unmute if, if that's your more comfortable means of communicating your question. So, um, with all of the challenges that we face in doing this online, let me uh, uh, welcome Jenny and uh, ask her to take, well, it's not the floor, it's not the podium, but uh, at least at least control of, uh, control of the Zoom meeting. Thank you so much, Bill. Can you hear me okay? Is my volume okay? Great. Um, I'm so happy to be with you tonight, even if only virtually. I wish I was in New York, but you know, I'm in Wisconsin. What are you going to do? Um, hopefully, someday I'll be able to get back to New York. Um, Bill, that was the first introduction I've ever been given that highlighted Netflix. And I have to say, my teenage kids never thought what I did was very cool until it landed on Netflix. And now they think what I do is kind of cool. So, you know, it's good to have some street cred with the youth. But that's not what I want to talk about today. Um, I am going to talk about language and just give you a little snapshot of some of the research that we and other groups around the world have been doing to try to understand 
how it is that this massively complex system that lives in the world, language, gets from the world into a baby's head. And in order to sort of get us all on the same page, I just want you to stop and think for a moment about just how much you know when you know a language. You know an insane amount if you know a language. If you know two languages, you know two insane amounts. It's crazy how much information lives in human languages. So as you listen to me speak, you hear familiar sounds, you hear familiar words, you know the meanings of those words. This is all stuff you have to learn, right? You also are doing something that um, I'll talk more about later. That is, you are noticing where my words begin and end, even though I don't talk like this. You still perceive words as little units of meaning, sort of like the little white spaces on the page, but there's no little white spaces in the auditory world. That's an illusion. You know how words get ordered so that in English, um, the sequence of words, the dog bit the man means something totally different than the man bit the dog, even though it's the same words, we've just reordered them. And you also know that a sentence like dog the man the bit is ungrammatical in English, although it is grammatical in Japanese. So you know all of this stuff. How do you know it? Where did you get all of this information? So in my research program, what I try to understand with my students is where linguistic knowledge comes from, how we figure out how all that stuff in the world, the sounds, the meanings, the signs, if you're lucky enough to be learning a sign language, how all that information gets into the baby's head. And to tell you about that, I'm also going to be trying to share with you some of the methods that we use because babies are really cute and they're a lot of fun, but they're also, you know, they, they can be pretty tricky to study. And so a lot of very clever people in this field have developed really lovely ways to get inside babies' heads, not with magnets or electrodes, but by looking at where they look while they're listening to things, how they, how they follow sounds. So I'm gonna also try to share with you some of the methods that we use to show you just how scientific something as warm and fuzzy as babies can be. Um, and I'll just add as a caveat, um, because I'm covering a lot of turf in this brief presentation, I'm not gonna be able to go into a lot of detail on many of the things I'm going to say. And I didn't include citations or references for a lot of what I'm gonna talk about just because there wasn't space on my slides. So if I talk about something that really piques your interest, please feel free to shoot me an email. I'm happy to send you papers or share more information with you. Okay, so let's start at what seems like the beginning. Um, so the thing that most parents and grandparents are waiting for with bated breath is that first word. That's what we kind of focus on a lot as caregivers. And in fact, um, oh, and I'll, I'll add that that on average happens at around 12 months of postnatal life. Of course, that's an average. That means half of the babies it's earlier, half the babies it's later. So that's important to know. Um, it's earlier for babies who are learning sign languages like American Sign Language. The first sign happens on average at about 10 months, not 12 months. It's a little bit easier to work the muscles in the hand than the muscles in the mouth. And so researchers, even in my field of psychology, often talk about babies under 12 months as pre-linguistic or pre-verbal, like they don't know anything about language because they haven't actually started to talk yet. But what babies know is so much greater than what they can say. And what I'm gonna be talking about today is really what's happening in this first year and actually even prenatally um, that helps set babies up as native language listeners before they start being native language speakers. So I'm gonna to try to give you just a few kind of neat data points about what babies know when about their native language or native languages if they're lucky enough to be bilingual. And I have more to say about bilingualism as well. 
So I'm actually going to start before birth. And actually, I have a question in the chat um, about how much language babies learn in the womb. They actually learn some stuff. Now, you might be thinking, really? Like, how would you know that? How would we know what a baby is learning when it's a fetus prior to being born? Well, this is where we get into these cool methods. So one thing researchers do, this is not work I've done, but other researchers actually can put like big speakers or massive headphones on top of the pregnant woman's abdomen and play sounds. And it turns out, for example, that late in fetal development, a fetus, their heart rate will start pounding faster when they hear their mother's voice through those speakers than when they hear someone else's voice. So they're actually starting to learn the patterns of their mother's voice. It's not the loudest thing they're hearing. The loudest thing in there is actually the mother's digestive system, which is very, very loud. And they're also hearing the mother's heart rate. That's another thing they're getting a lot of exposure to. But they are getting some speech. And if any of you remember the Charlie Brown specials, like what the teachers and grown ups sound like in the Charlie Brown specials, they sound sort of like, uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. that's what the fetuses are getting. They're hearing that sort of rhythm of speech. Another way we know this is we can test babies right after they're born. Again, this isn't work that I have done, but that my colleagues have done. And give them, so the way this works is you give the fetus an experience through the mother's voice, and then you test the baby after it's born to see if the baby remembers it. So the most famous of these studies is called the cat and the hat study, because the researchers had the pregnant women read passages of Dr. Seuss while they were pregnant. And then after the fetuses are born into babies, um, they're tested using an apparatus that you can see here where the baby is actually sucking on a pacifier that triggers sound. And the babies suck harder to hear the story that they heard while they were still fetuses. Now that didn't sound like words and stuff. It just sounded like woo, 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 woo. but they're learning that rhythm. They're learning the music of speech even before they're born. Oops. Um, so just as a little public service message, this might make you think, oh, I should go out and buy things to play music or speech to my fetus. No, you don't need to do that. Your fetus is getting plenty of stimulation. It's hearing its mother's heartbeat, its mother's gastric sounds, its mother's voice. That's fine. You don't need to do any more. And actually as a sort of general rule in terms of things like the amount of input babies need, the kinds of experiences they need, you don't need to do anything special. Just the experiences that they evolved to have floating around in our uterus in this particular case are enough for them to start to learn. During the neonate period, those first two months of prenatal life, a lot of interesting perceptual abilities emerge. So as young as you can test um, neonates, they prefer their mother's language over other languages. And we think that's something else they learned while they were inside the womb. Um, they seem to like the rhythmic patterns of the language they heard inside the womb. I have an asterisk here to remind me to mention that for babies who are born bilingual, their mother was speaking two languages while they were in the womb. The baby uh, actually doesn't show a preference between the two languages, but prefers both of those languages to any other language. So they're learning about two languages in the womb in this case. Babies love what we call infant-directed speech. Infant-directed speech, it's not the words like goo goo ga ga, stuff like that. It's the music of the speech. Look at the turtle. Do you see mommy's turtle? Even at birth, babies prefer to listen to that kind of speech over speech uh, in an adult-directed register. Um, how do we know this? We know this from the kinds of sucking experiments I mentioned a moment ago. We also know it from experiments like ones I'll tell you more about in a moment, where babies turn their heads to trigger different sounds. Babies also prefer infant-directed music. It turns out that we sing differently to babies than we do to adults, which is kind of extraordinary. Um, and 
if you could design like the perfect baby stimulus, it would probably be, this is, I can't prove this scientifically, but like I'm pretty sure based on what we know, it would be the baby is being held here. This is about as far as a baby can see around birth. They can't really see any farther than that. So seeing a face smiling at them and singing, like that is gold for a very young baby. Babies also prefer speech to non-speech at this age. But interestingly, and not surprisingly, they haven't actually learned anything specific about their native language. So for example, a two-month-old infant who is, say, um, learning Japanese can still distinguish between the sound ra and the sound la, which are not differentiated in Japanese, but are differentiated in other languages. And a two-month-old is a citizen of the world. They can still distinguish between that pair of sounds. What's the first thing babies seem to really learn? Well, think about what the most frequent thing a baby probably hears is. What's the word a baby's going to hear the most? Probably their name. And by four months of age, they can't even hold their heads up really at four months of age, although I, this picture of a four month old is, um, they recognize their own name. Now, what do I mean by that? I don't mean that they know it refers to them. I don't mean that at four months, I knew that Jenny meant me, but it means that I recognize those sounds as somewhat more familiar than say the sounds of Bill's name. So how do we know that? Well, this is where we get into the science. Um, so the method I'm going to tell you about now is a method that I'll be showing you from my own lab a little bit later. The study was not done in my lab. Um, the way this kind of method works is the baby is seated on a caregiver's lap. The caregiver is listening to audio, so they can't hear what the baby is hearing and sort of bias the baby in any way. So it's all, you know, good scientific method. In front of the baby and on both sides of the baby are little blinking lights that we use to draw the baby's attention. And there are also audio speakers on both sides of the room. In this experiment, what the researchers did was they would blink a light on one side of the room and then start to repeat a word that was either the baby's name or some other name. So the baby, if it was me, I might hear on some trials, Jenny, 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 and it would repeat for as long as I kept looking at that light. When I looked away, the sound would turn off, the light would turn off, and a new trial would start. The next trial might be Bill, 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 and so on and so forth. And what the researchers found was that by four months of age, babies would attend longer to their own name than to someone else's name, which we take as evidence that they've learned their name. Not that it means them, we don't think they know any word meanings at four months, but they picked out those sounds and they orient to them, which I think is extraordinary when you think about just how squishy and seemingly blob-like a four-month-old is. Now, as we keep moving along, babies do become much more sophisticated native listeners. By six to eight months of age, babies have become specialized at perceiving their own language. So they are actually perceiving the vowels of their native language differently than vowels that are not in their native language. They're also becoming adept at something I mentioned a little bit earlier that I'll talk a lot more about in a few minutes, which is figuring out where words begin and end. They're starting to be able to pull words out of the soup of speech all around them. And I'll talk more about how they do that in a moment. By six months of age, they do actually start to understand some words, really frequent, really simple words. Now, how do we know that? Um, this is a photo from my lab, although the study was not done in my lab, but I can show you how we have this set up. So again, we have the caregiver, uh, the parent and the baby are sitting again in, uh, in our lab. And in front of the baby is a screen that's showing two images here. Um, so in this particular case, the baby is seeing a screen that shows a, a spoon and an apple. And then the baby hears speech like, where's the apple? Can you find it? 
And what we measure is how quickly the baby shifts his gaze to the image of the apple. If he doesn't know the meaning of the word apple, then he should be just a 50%. He shouldn't know where to look. But if he knows that um, apple is this thing over here, then he should be able to shift his gaze to apple. And by six months of age, um, again, a good six months before babies are saying any words, um, babies seem at least to understand some words. I will note that if you ask their parent if they understand the words, their parent will say no. So this is actually a really nice example where our science suggests that babies have knowledge that parents don't know they have, which is especially cool because parents generally think their babies are like amazing and brilliant, which they are. You want parents to think their babies are amazing and brilliant, but babies are actually more amazing and brilliant than their parents realize. So, um, now babies are getting really sophisticated by the last, uh, the end of the first postnatal year. Uh, they have acquired the, the, the perception of the consonants in their native language. So now if we go back to that Japanese learning baby, uh, J Japanese doesn't distinguish between ra and la. They're the same sound in Japanese. By eight to 12 months of age, a Japanese learning baby will no longer be able to tell the difference between ra and la. An English learning baby will, but an English learning baby won't be able to tell the difference between sounds in Hindi like ta and da, which sound the same to me as an English speaker. But if I were a Hindi baby um, or adult, I would be able to distinguish those. So the point, the broader point here, isn't about these details. The broader point is that all of this is happening before the baby says her first word. And that just shows how much is going on under the hood. I'm gonna take questions in just a second. I just want to note, this is really important sort of public service information. Many people worry that um, bilingualism might slow babies down um, because they have so much to learn. But remarkably, pretty much everything that I have described thus far happens at just about the same time in bilingual babies than it does in monolingual babies. So babies are not slowed down by learning two languages. They might be like a few weeks delayed in some of these things, but that's nothing compared to being bilingual. So let me take a look at a, just a couple of the questions. Um, I have two questions at the end here about tonal languages like Chinese. Great questions. Um, I'm going to say a little more about tonal languages a little later, but um, just for people who aren't aware of this, some languages like Chinese, Thai, Hmong, um, some Bantu languages in Africa use pitch very differently than languages like English do. So the meaning of the word is completely changed by the pitch or the pitch contour with which you say the word. Um, and the question, one of the questions is, do Chinese babies recognize pitch better than Western babies? The evidence suggests not at this age, no. Um, and in fact, uh, well, I'll, I'm gonna come back to this a little bit later, but there's some evidence to suggest that there aren't big differences um, in tonal learning and non-tonal learning babies early in life. Um, another question here, oh yes, uh, will babies and toddlers experience speech delays due to people around them wearing masks? That is, do babies need to see the mouth? So we don't know, but my guess is it won't make a difference. And here's why I think that. Um, one reason is that babies actually um, look at the eyes during the first year a lot more than the mouth. Um, so the Baby, because babies' visual perception develops more slowly than their auditory perception, they tend to be very interested in things with high visual contrast, like black versus white. That's why all those toys are black and white. The eyes have much more visual contrast in them than the mouth. And so babies actually during this period tend to spend a lot of time on the eyes. Um, the other reason I'm not too concerned is that babies um, in our experiments that I'll share with you in a few minutes, um, don't have access to faces at all, and they learn a tremendous amount just from listening. We also know that blind babies appear to be learning language on roughly the same timetable as babies who, um, who can see. That said, you know, the masks are weird and they are masking a lot of emotion. And so if I were gonna put money on this, I would bet 
that th there are not going to be so many effects on language learning, but picking up some emotional cues might be a little slower depending on just how much time babies are spending with people with masks. That's just, that's just a, my crazy guess. Um, oh my gosh, there's so many questions. Uh, I'm going to um, answer just one more. Uh, I have heard of the language acquisition device. Is this a concept with which you're familiar? And if so, comment on it. So the language acquisition device is the hypothesis put forth by the linguist Noam Chomsky that a lot of what's going on in language learning is that babies come equipped with knowledge about the languages of the world, innate knowledge about how languages work. Um, whether or not that's true, these data don't speak to that because all of the things I've talked about so far have to be learned. You can't build innate knowledge into a baby that uh, la and ra are going to be the same sound or different sounds because depending on what language you learn, they may or may not be the same. You can't build innate knowledge into a baby that cat is going to mean the fuzzy thing with the long tail because if you happen to learn Spanish, it's not cat, it's gato. So, a lot of Chomsky's arguments are really about pretty complicated aspects of grammar, where we, we just, to be honest, um, I don't think we have the data yet to really know a ton about how that stuff is learned. If you want to push me in the question period, I will tell you my, uh, my opinion, um, but I don't think I'm going to do that quite now, because um, I would like to keep going on telling you about my own work. And I will answer more questions shortly. Let me just check the time. OK, great. Um, all right, so in my research, in my lab at the University of Wisconsin, we do experiments to try to figure out how babies figure out how their native languages work. We also study what happens when the learning process doesn't work quite right. So when something is going on with the child that's going to make language learning uh, more challenging. Um, so what, there are many aspects of language that we could be studying we focused a great deal of attention on something that seems counterintuitive. And that is the idea that part of how babies learn language is by essentially being statisticians. They're doing math. Now, by that, I don't mean that babies are doing like differential equations and linear algebra or anything fancy like that. What I mean is that babies, and by extension, humans, have brains that are very sensitive to things like probability and frequency, and that that sort of information could be really useful as you try to figure out how your language works. So if you sort of look at the structure of languages, um, there's a lot of statistical information that lives inside them. What do I mean by that? Well, I'll give you a couple of ex uh, quick examples here. One example comes from the music of speech. Um, so speech is very musical. It has rhythmic patterns. It has pitch patterns. These vary from language to language. So in English, for example, if you're a two syllable word in English, you probably start with a stressed syllable. You're louder, you're longer, you're higher pitched. Baby, cookie, mommy, daddy. Over 90% of the words that we speak to babies, if they're two syllables long, have that sort of pattern. But in French, it's the opposite. So French is much more da da, da da, da da. These are probabilistic regularities. These are statistics that a baby could possibly pick up on to help them figure out how the language works. And indeed, nine month old English learning babies have learned that words tend to, the two syllable words tend to start with stressed syllables. I'm going to actually skip these examples because I want to get to our research. Um, so what we wanted to ask is whether babies can actually pick up on the statistics of the languages that they hear and use them to learn. And to ask this question, we focused on a very particular, in our original work, the, the work that Bill was referring to, um, we focused on a great problem. Um, which is figuring out where words begin and end. So some of you might remember this old uh, cartoon from the far side where um, what we say to dogs, okay, Ginger, I've had it. You stay out of the garbage, understand Ginger, so on. 
what is the dog here? Blah, blah, ginger, blah, 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 ginger, blah, blah, blah. This is the problem we all face with language when we're babies because we don't talk like this. Babies have to figure out where one word ends and the next one begins. And so to explain this problem and sort of the statistics solution to it, I'm gonna use a somewhat hackneyed example, but imagine this sequence, pretty baby. You're a baby, you're hearing this. How many words is that? It could be four words, pr, t, be, be. It could be one long word, pretty baby. It could be three words, it could be two words. How would you possibly know? Well, one way you could figure this out is by doing a little math across the language you've heard so far. And if you did that, you would quickly notice that when you hear pr, you hear t next a lot. You don't hear it every time. Sometimes you hear pretend, prevaricate, predilection. Most babies don't hear that. Um, the intuition I'm trying to give you is that if you hear pr in English, it's likely to be followed by T, especially if you're a baby. However, at this word boundary, when you hear T, bay is pretty unlikely to come next because so many other things could happen after T. Um, we could have pretty dress, pretty sunset, uh, pretty cake. We also have tea pot. Uh, uh, tea, well, tea cake. Um, so the intuition here is that after tea, bay is kind of unlikely. And you might be able to use that information to tell you that that's a word boundary, that tea and bay don't actually go together. And in fact, if we do the math on this in speech to babies, pr goes before tea about 80% of the time. If we were in a room, I'd make you guess, but I can't do that on Zoom. Um, but T predicts bay only 0.02% of the time. That's really unlikely. And so the intuition here is that a suitably equipped baby who could sort of chug away on these sorts of statistics might be able to figure out that pretty goes together, but T bay does not. That pretty is a word, T bay is not a word. So that's an intuition, but how do you test it with babies? Um, so what we did was we made up a language, we played it to eight month olds, and then we tested them to see if they learned its statistics. So let me show, I'm gonna play you a little of this speech. Hopefully you can hear it. This is what we played for babies in this study. I am the only native speaker of this language and I am the only person to whom this means anything. It's just a sequence of syllables. So, oops, you don't want to hear that again. So this is essentially what the babies heard in this study, but it had a bunch of structure underlying it. So it had words in it like tokibu and gikoba and gopila, but of course the babies didn't know that and there were no spaces to tell the babies where the words began and ended. So we have, you know, like I mentioned, a word like tokibu here. We also have sequences that go across word boundaries like boogie ko, if my PowerPoint will advance, yeah, boogie ko. We're calling that a part word. It's a sequence that goes across a word boundary. Babies have heard it, it's not a word. So babies listen to this thing for two minutes. Um, they're sitting on their parents' lap uh, this, this is me a long time ago. Um, they're sitting on their parents' lap and they we're using that same blinking light technique. So for the first two minutes, the babies hear this. They hear go pee la ba boo poo koo pee la da do da da do whatever the sequence was for two minutes. And then we test them by using that light blinking technique. So the center light, the room goes silent for our test. The center light starts to blink to draw the baby's attention. I'll show you a video in a moment. Then when the baby's looking at the center light, when we have their attention, they're not trying to eat their socks or grab their parents' headphones or whatever, the experimenter who's outside of this room, but watching on a closed circuit TV, turns off the light turn, and starts blinking a light on the side. When the baby turns to look at that light, he starts to hear something like, go pila, go pila, go pila, 
keeps going as long as he keeps looking. When he looks away, the sound turns off, the light turns off, and the center light starts again. So the baby is the boss. He controls how long we play each of these items for him. So I'm just gonna show you a quick video. It's an old video. Um, I apologize for the quality, but I will narrate a little bit over it. Two P row, 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 two. Center lights on, side lights on. Center light. Side light. He looks away, but he comes back quick, so we keep going. And he's done with that trial. Okay. So he was controlling what we played. And what we did was we, um, we, we compared how long babies wanted to listen to words from this language versus part words. And our hypothesis was that if all the babies did was hear the syllables, they shouldn't be able to tell the difference between those different types of items. But if they learned the statistics, the words have better, stronger, more coherent statistics to them than the part words. Oh, sorry. And in fact, what we find and what has been replicated now in many, many different settings is that babies are really sensitive to these sorts of statistics. Even newborn infants using other types of sounds um, are able to pick up on these regularities. Um, someone asked in the chat about other species. Monkeys, some species of monkeys like cotton top tamarins are also able to track these statistics. Rats are able to track these sorts of statistics, although not quite as well as humans. Um, we've been able to run other sorts of stimuli, for example, like real languages like this, not just those weird made up ones, but real languages like this one. Questo i piccoli dentro casa ho coricato all'ombra del melo verde. Per ascoltare la fuga, quasi cadi sul melo inciampi sulla pira sull'erba. Babies track statistics in Italian. They also track statistics in non-linguistic stimuli like this one. So before I go on, I want to address a really great question uh, from MM who asked, wasn't, wasn't the baby just responding to the light source? No, that's a great question. The light source draws the baby's attention to that side, but the light source only play, uh, the light source is the same regardless of what sound we play. So if we see different amounts of interest in the words versus the part words, which is what we found, it can't be because of the light source because the light source is always the same. It's just our way of giving us something to measure their attention. But we know that if babies listen longer to the words than the part words, or actually in this case, they listen longer to part words than words, um, it can't be because of the lights because the lights were always the same. So I hope that makes sense. Um, was there a specific reason why we picked those uh, particular syllable sounds? There was. I decided to choose sounds that, would, um, that were most representative of the languages of the world because I thought that it was possible that I might want to run these studies with babies in other countries as well. And so I chose um, sequences like pa and ba and ta because those sounds are pretty representative. The vowels differ a little bit, but the, those sounds are much more representative of languages of the world. Whereas if I had chosen more idiosyncratic, very English sounds, then I would be more limited to uh, English speaking babies. Uh, was that Simon, the tones, um, the game Simon? Um, those were just the sine wave tones. Uh, so I made those up myself. Uh, so yeah, what those were, that's a different kind of statistics. That's, so I'm also a musician and I'm really interested in infant music perception. That's from an experiment showing that babies remember, oh, that's, that's my alarm to tell me that it's 7.15. So I'm gonna wrap up in a, just a few minutes for more questions. Um, that was from an experiment where we built in statistics, not of things like syllables, but of musical pitches. So what's the probability that C sharp is followed by F is followed by D. And it turned out that babies in that study were actually able 
to learn the statistics of those sounds. Um, is this idea linked to why Broadway musicals play overtures before the performance? I've always wondered about that. I don't actually know. Um, let me come back to your question, Angela, just in a few minutes. I want to just say a little bit more about bilingualism because there have been a few questions about that as well. So one of the questions that I frequently get when I talk about this work is, what, what happens with bilingual babies who are doing statistical learning? How does that work? Well, the first thing babies have to do, and you know, their bilingualism is just, you know, it's such a amazing thing and it's such a common thing that this is something we're really interested in studying. Um, in some countries, labs like mine, like if, uh, my colleagues in Vancouver and Barcelona um, and uh, Singapore, they can't find monolingual babies. There aren't monolingual babies for them to test. Um, so there's a lot of interest in bilingualism. In order to do these statistical learning tasks, what the baby has to figure out first is that they're hearing two languages. So if you stop and think about it for a minute, you're, let's say you're a baby learning English and Spanish. How do you know that there's two languages? No one tells you. <laughs> How would you know you're a two month old? Um, so basically the first thing babies have to do is to figure out that they're actually getting input from two languages, not one. We don't actually fully know how they do that. We know one, we know how they don't do it. Um, it doesn't require the sort of one parent, one language strategy that some of you might be familiar with. The idea that the only way for bilinguals to learn is to have parent one only ever speak English and parent two only ever speak Spanish. Turns out that most families don't actually do that and babies learn two languages just fine. What we think is going on, yes, someone in the chat said cadence differentiates language. Yes, we think that it's that same early attention to rhythm. Remember when we talked about even prenatal stuff that the, the fetuses are attending to rhythm? That's a really important distinction between languages. English is more da, 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 da. Spanish is more da, 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 da. That information is what we think they're using to pull apart the languages. And then they have to track the statistics separately for each language. We do lab tasks to look at that. Um, it's challenging, but it appears to be doable for them. Um, I want to just, oh, and bilinguals actually in general do really well on these sorts of tasks. So we're about to run out of time. I just want to um, end by, before I take some more questions, saying that a lot of the research in my lab now is not just with typically developing infants and young children, but we do a lot of research trying to take the methods that I've been telling you about, like the moving the eyes around, the turning the head, to study language development in children who are not following typical language development pathways or who might be at risk for uh, challenges in language development. And I wish we had time. If you're particularly interested, uh, I can tell you a little bit more about that during the question period. But I think where I'd like to leave you before I take a few more questions is, I think you all already knew this, but babies are possibly even more exceptional learners than you knew. They are just so good at picking up on patterns and they do it without instruction. No parent goes up to their baby and says, okay, today we're gonna learn word boundaries. I am talking like this. No one does that. And if we did, the baby would be like, you're crazy. Um, babies soak up this information just because they're interested. Um, they're motivated to learn. That said, I think we barely scratched the surface. I've been doing this work now um, for about 30 years and I don't think we will answer any of these questions in my lifetime, um, which is great by me. I think we just keep asking new questions and discovering new things. Um, and my fervent wish is that we will be eventually able to take everything we're learning about typical development and use it to help improve the lives of children who are at risk for language disorders or other sorts of uh, challenges. Uh, so before I take more questions, I just want to thank um, my students who actually do all of this work. 
um, all the, the funding that I've had uh, the great fortune to get from the taxpayers of the United States. Uh, then of course, most importantly, the thousands and thousands of babies and families who have been part of my research over the years. We test about a thousand babies a year. Um, we've actually just ported all of our research onto Zoom. So right now we're testing babies um, around the country. So if there are any of you uh, who know babies who wanna participate in our research, um, we can reach out to you via Zoom. And I love this slide to end on. These are the children of my own graduate students and postdocs. So these are my intellectual grandbabies. So I'll let you look at these cute, cute folks while I answer a few of these questions. Um, okay, are there any statistical differences between genders? It's a great question. Um, you know, in language development in general, we do see girls or females, um, uh, genetic females, actually moving along more quickly in language development than genetic males. So you do see early differences in some of these kinds of experiments I've been telling you about where the girls um, often do just a smidge better. We don't see that in our statistical learning experiments so much, um, but uh, in general, I would say the, that uh, females tend to outperform males just a smidge um, in these early, early language learning kinds of tasks. Um, let's see. Uh, Ah, yes. Um, are the neurobiological phonological deficits represented in dyslexia evident in the research you've done with regards to baby statistical differentiation? Yes. So it turns out, and this is, this is part of these other talks that I'm not giving today, um, but it does actually turn out that uh, children with developmental dyslexia have a more difficult time with the sort of gola, bu, pa, bi, ku, tu, ti, bu sorts of tasks. Um, of course, we don't test them with their turning their heads and stuff. We test them in a more appropriate way for children. But yeah, it does seem to be the case that possibly because um, individuals with dyslexia have a bit harder time hanging on to the sounds of, of language, we do see some challenges there in these statistical learning tasks. That's a great question. And if you're interested, I can send you some publications from other groups on that. Um, let's see. Uh, does my department have longitudinal language studies as well? Um, I haven't been involved in longitudinal studies uh, in part because um, I've been so focused on these very early, early years, but there are lots of other labs um, around the country that are doing really interesting longitudinal studies showing, for example, that infants' abilities with early speech perception, like telling the difference between ba and pa, predicts their vocabularies later on, or how quickly babies are able to um, shift their eye gaze to the apple when they hear apple, predicts um, kindergarten readiness. Um, so there is actually some really brilliant longitudinal work out there in the field that I would be, I would be happy, happy to share. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, we hear more about language delays, but can early, early talkers be explained? Such a good question. Um, you know, people don't tend to work on the precocious end as much um, because it's not a public health concern. Um, you know, the public health concern is the, the late talkers, the, the late language emergence, the children who are at risk. Um, I can tell you my sort of hypothesis about that sort of precocity, um, which is, I think babies kind of get interested in different things. And some babies get really interested in like engaging and faces and talk, you know, that sort of back and forth dyadic interaction. Other babies might be more interested in, um, you know, making the wheels go on their toy. I think babies get interested in different things. Um, I will say that part of what's exciting about this kind of work is that we can see what I would call preco precocious knowledge in a very wide range of babies, um, even ones who aren't talking yet. Um, and just to give you a teaser for another kind of work that I do, I have another large research project on um, toddlers who are autistic um, and how their language understanding is emerging. 
And just like I mentioned with the six month olds who understand words that their parents say they don't know, autistic toddlers understand words that their parents say they don't know if we test them in this very sensitive way of do they shift their eye gaze to the apple when they hear apple. So I actually think that there's precocity all around us. We just often can't see it because it's not visible um, without doing the experiments. Um, oh, there's so many good questions. Um, someone asked about Williams syndrome babies. Uh, so Williams syndrome is a form of intellectual disability where children are um, uh, profoundly impaired in things like visuospatial reasoning, but their language skills and their musical skills actually stay pretty much within the normal range, sometimes quite precocious. We actually ran our Golabu Pabiku Tutibu experiment with babies with Williams syndrome, and they look just like typically developing babies, which is not what you would really expect uh, from infants who have a, a pretty profound intellectual disability. So that was really exciting for us. Um, let's see, gosh, I think I could probably take what, one more question, Bill? Yeah, one. Uh, can no, you also okay. address, uh, there's another bilingualism question. Can you address sequential bilingualism? I know people worry about babies not learning English in kindergarten and later if there's no exposure to English at home. Thank you. Another opportunity for a public service announcement. Um, as long as kids are young enough, and by young enough, I would say like under the age of 10, they will, unless something is kind of amiss neurologically, they will be able to learn second language, third language, to the level of a native speaker. Um, all the evidence out there now about bilingual development suggests that as long as children get exposure to that second or third language before, well, some people would say before puberty, I think the data, maybe under the age of 10, it's a little hard to say, um, getting exposed to that language under the age of 10 or 12, they will have the capacity for being a native perceiver, native language user. Um, this if I can be on my soapbox for just one second, this gets to something that makes me nuts about the American educational system, which is that I don't know what it's like in the schools where all of you are, but at least in many parts of the United States, second languages are taught starting at puberty, right? They start in sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth grade, and they're required in college. Whereas what we should really be doing is acquiring, requiring second languages when kids are two or three, or four, not waiting until they're in high school. It's ridiculous. Um, sorry, that was soapboxy. And if you're recording this and putting it on YouTube, I should be a little bit careful what I say. Um, I should stop. Um, Bill, did you have any closing notes about how yes. people can access um, this? So uh, let me thank uh, everybody for their participation. It's, it's, um, it's still challenging, but in, in, in many ways, nice to get out, even if we're not out, uh, out from our usual rhythms, at least. Um, and I really want to thank Professor Saffron for a marvelous lecture, which obviously generated generated more interest than we could address in the available time. Um, she's been very generous and, and uh, uh, recommended that you email if, uh, if, if you have specific questions. Um, this will be this will be posted. Um, uh, and all of you who found your way in here will receive an email about the posting. Uh, and uh, we hope that you'll uh, stay in touch with us and, and however you learned about this event, um, you'll learn about more. And uh, Jenny, thank you again, this was marvelous. And I get the pleasure of seeing you again tomorrow, but uh, for the rest of us, thank you. Great. Thank you all, appreciate it so much. Stay safe out there.